Welcome to another edition of From the Preacher's Study. My name is Kevin Clark, and I, along with my friend and colleague, the preacher here at the Oak Mountain Church Christ, Bob Hutto, have the uh, privilege and the honor to be able to bring some more things from God's Word to you. We're very, very thankful for this format that we have. We're thankful for the audience. So many people, not only in this community, in this state, in this country, but across the world, who regularly tune in uh, to listen to this podcast and support it. We appreciate that. We appreciate the kind words that you give as well. And uh, we would ask that you would take that one step further and tell others about it. If you find value in this study of God's Word, share it with your neighbors, share it with your coworkers. If you're a student, share it with your fellow students, and even your teachers, and let them know. This is a really easy way to expose people to the gospel, bite-sized chunks. You know, we're talking 15 to 20 minutes. We're not asking for hours and hours of study. And uh, we really feel like any time you take God's Word and simply teach what it says, there's great value in that exercise. And so we would encourage you to, to spread the Word. We want to thank our two deacons, uh, Jason Reed and Mark Townsend, who are here with us as they always are, and really appreciate them taking their talents and their abilities and lending it to this exercise, making it possible for us to spread the Word uh, really across the world. And so we appreciate them and their families for the sacrifice they've made in lending them to us. Brother Hutto, any introductory comments? Well, we, really are, we really are just trying to hold forth the Word, you That's know, it. just try to That's put it. the Word forward. I believe the power is in the Word itself, in, in the Word of God, and just try to, uh, to teach it and uh, just uh, represent it accurately, what it says and how, how it applies. And if we'll consider that, if we'll be open and open our minds and hearts to what the Word says, well, then we can conform our lives to uh, what the Lord wants us to be. And so Amen. Uh, it's just so very important that, uh, we focus on the Word and uh, try to try to teach it accurately and make a good application. Amen. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> so y'all can probably tell I'm struggling a little bit with my voice, so y'all work with me here. But we're in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, we're going to start with verse 1. Uh, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. And we're going to stop there for a second. The rest of the passages we're going to read down through verse 7 Give us the qualifications of a bishop, but before we go there, I want to talk about what a bishop is, because if you're not familiar with that term, uh, you may be scratching your head, well, yeah, that's good that if a man desires this position, it's good, but what is the position? So let's talk a little bit about that, because there is some confusion about this position of bishop. Uh, it is often called other things as well in the scriptures, elder, uh, presbyter, uh, shepherd, and so all of these are different terms for the same office within a local congregation. So a bishop is a man who meets the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3. There's also a set of qualifications in Titus chapter 1 verses 5 through 9. We would take those together who collectively meets those conditions and he along with other men similarly qualified uh, lead local congregations. Now let's look some passages on that. 1 Peter chapter 5 one through four does a really good job of laying out what it is to be a bishop or an elder or a shepherd. First Peter chapter five, verses one through four, the Bible says this, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Listen to this, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Now remember the question that was raised, 1 Timothy 3, if a man desires the work of a bishop, he desires a good thing. What is a bishop? A bishop is the same thing as an elder. And here's Peter who says, I, who am a fellow elder, I'm going to give you some instructions as elders as well. And he tells you what an elder is. What does he say? He's a shepherd for the flock of God, which is among you. And so that tells us some things. First of all, it tells us about the type of leadership. You know, the, the imagery of a shepherd is used intentionally. If we understand the relationship of a shepherd to his flock of sheep, how he lovingly guides them, he's with the sheep, he spends time with the sheep, the sheep hear his voice, the sheep know him. It's, it's not a, a power play, a dictatorial, do this, don't do that. It's a very loving relationship where the shepherd leads by example. In fact, if you see that, uh, go down to verse um, three, he says, but being examples to the flock. 
And so that's the kind of leadership that an elder is supposed to exercise. And notice the, the extent of that exercise leadership. It says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. And so we're talking about individual congregations having a multiplicity of men, a plurality of men, we're going to make this point in just a second, uh, that are governing that local congregation. So you would have elders in the church of Thessalonica. You would have elders in the church at Corinth. And the elders in the church of Thessalonica would govern the flock at Thessalonica. They would not govern the flock in Corinth or any other location. You wouldn't have some uber elder. You wouldn't have some hierarchical. He says, you shepherd the flock of God that is among you. The flock that you worship with, the flock that you're in, that's your jurisdiction. And how you exercise that, he says, don't do it by compulsion. It's something you should want to do. Don't do it for dishonest gain. You're not doing it for the material uh, gain that you can possibly get. Uh, don't be lords over those entrusted to you. I like that, that uh, phrase, entrusted to you. The idea that God has given you this group of people for you to shepherd, for you to lead, for you to protect, for you to nurture and cherish. So there's a lot in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, that gives us some insight about this position of a bishop or an elder that Timothy talks, or Paul talks about in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Well, another passage, a very similar is Acts mm -hmm. chapter 20. <clears throat> Paul, uh, on his way to back to uh, Jerusalem, uh, he, uh, he calls to meet with the Ephesian elders, the elders from right. Ephesus. See that in verse 17. Mm -hmm. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Right. When they had come to, the, to him, he said to them. Then we have a long, mm -hmm. a long account of his conversation with them. And then in verse 28 he says, mm -hmm. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you. New American Standard Bible says overseers. Right. It's away from that word bishop. Right. I'm sure because of its... Yeah, uh, ecclesiastical associations, right. you know. So, uh, so here, but it's very clear that the elders in verse seventeen mm -hmm. are also described as overseers or bishops in verse twenty-eight, and That's so right. it's clear those two terms refer to the same to the same office. An elder kind of describes what he is. He's right. He's a, he's a mature man. Right. He's got experience. He's a little older. An overseer describes what he does. He yep. oversees uh, the flock of God. He oversees the local church. By, by which we mean, and what the scriptures mean, he's working with the people. That's right. It's not uh, a business administrator's job, you know, where he's, <laughs> the church is some sort of, a, you know, institution, looking at it in an institutional sort of way. Right. The, the church is the people. And so when he oversees the church, he's overseeing, he's he's leading and guiding and shepherding that's the right. people. Amen. Uh, and that's his responsibility. Amen. Let me add to that. I love Hebrews 13, 17. Another verse that uh, seems to uh, address the role of elders. Uh, the Hebrew writer, the writer of Hebrews says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So maybe you're thinking, well, that's fine, but it doesn't say who these people are. Well, we only have a handful of options based on the scriptures. We know that they're uh, elders and we know that they're deacons. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we get deeper into 1 Timothy chapter 3. And then we also have evangelists. Uh, the only one that fits the description of what we just read over in 1 Peter chapter 5 and what my brother Hutto read in Acts 20 is an elder. Obey those who rule over you. And so he's talking talking about elders, and notice this, they watch out for your souls. Isn't that comforting that we have men who are qualified, who are looking out for our spiritual welfare, that we're not in this just by ourselves. We certainly have God on our side, but we also have designated men that God has said, you know what, your responsibility is to watch out for this flock. And here's another level of accountability. It says they have to give account for how they look out for the flock. So in addition to them just giving answer, as 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11 says, what they do in the body, good or bad, part of that is how have they led the flock of God that they've mm -hmm. been entrusted with. And so uh, this is a very serious thing. Uh, think about in the Old Testament how much emphasis was placed on the people who spiritually led mm. uh, Israel and how God had very high standards for them. And, and, and a lot of the condition of the people uh, would be affected strongly by the leadership of those people. Well, the same principle applies here. 
a lot of the condition of our local churches uh, will turn on what kind of leadership do those local congregations have. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very important, and uh, my my brother here, Bob Hutto, is an elder, Mm. and so you can speak to this not just academically, but also experientially. So you have any thoughts about that? Well, it is it is a, a weighty responsibility and you take it very seriously. You do the best you can. You work in conjunction with the other elders. As you said a moment ago, when you read about elders being appointed in a local church, there's always a plurality That's right. of elders. You don't have a kind of a one pastor right. system yep. uh, taught in, in the scriptures. You always have a, uh, at least two, a plurality of men, maybe more than two. Um, who are who, who are qualified, who meet the descriptions that we have in mm-hmm. first, first Timothy 3 and Titus. But you work together, and there's wisdom in that. You know, you've got um, one man, and his, his personality is this type, and yep. these are his strengths. And then you've got another man, and his personality a little bit different type, and he's got other strengths, and so they complement each other. And uh, as they, and then maybe you have two or three more, whatever, however many you've got, you sit down at a table, you've got an issue that you're trying to, to address and resolve, and you put all of that together and work mm-hmm. harmoniously, and we complement each other, and our strengths kind of match each other, and uh, we, we uh, hopefully, prayerfully, uh, we arrive at the, a good decision about those things. And so there's wisdom in having a multiplicity of mm-hmm. men serving uh, in in that capacity, and uh, you can see God's wisdom in it. You can also see God's wisdom in that. You know, there, there is there is leadership, right, right, uh, right. and so um, it, it, I think it's right for a church to exist without elders. We can see right, right. scriptural precedent for that That's in Acts right. chapter fourteen. That's right. Churches are established, and uh-huh. then Paul goes back, go back and appoints elders. Yep. And so they must have existed for a period of time without elders. But however you make decisions under those circumstances, it's it's going to be inefficient, and um, you know, it's, and then. But so if you can appoint elders and men that you you trust, you you, you know they have wisdom collectively. They have a lot of wisdom. Right. That's going to be a much more efficient way of um, of leading of leading the church and making decisions within the congregation. There's wisdom in God's plan. We trust God's plan. Amen. Amen. Uh, we trust that it's the best the best way to do it, and so we we try to follow that. I was, I was thinking about Acts chapter 14 mm-hmm, yep. and your point that you made a moment ago about uh, the, an elder's authority being limited to right. the congregation, that local congregation mm-hmm. of which he was a part. Mm-hmm. Well, Acts chapter 14 corroborates that. Mm-hmm, this is mm-hmm. kind of corroborating evidence. And so uh, Paul and Barnabas are on their, their first journey here right. and they're coming to an end. They've traveled through several cities. <clears throat> and then in verse 21, it says, after they had preached the gospel of that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church mm-hmm. and prayed with fasting, they commended them to uh, to the Lord in whom they had believed. Why, why, why appoint elders in every church? Right. Why not just appoint and you know a group of elders maybe right. in one church and they could oversee Mm-mm. because the, again corroborating evidence because the elders authority extends only it doesn't extend beyond that local church right. and so elders are appointed in every church and so uh the the men that I serve with here at Oak Mountain uh we we don't make decisions on behalf of other congregations right, right. Uh, we make decisions for this local church and that's as far as our authority goes that according to scripture well and you said something i wanted to talk about very briefly you mentioned the word pastor and that's another word pastor elder presbyter bishop and you know in the religious world sometimes there's a misunderstanding of that term i think it's used a lot as the preacher my pastor but but a pastor is an elder or is a bishop and they must meet these qualifications that we see in First Timothy chapter three, verses one through seven, also in Titus one five through nine. And if they don't satisfy those qualifications, uh, they're not a pastor. And a pastor's work is not necessarily being the preacher, although certainly he's got to be able to convict the right. gainsayer, as all elders are supposed to. But we're talking about the eldership. So I think a lot of times there's a misunderstanding about right. those terms. So in Acts twenty is another good example of that. Uh, he calls together the elders, verse 17. Yeah. We've already seen, skipping down to verse 28, mm-hmm. that they had been made overseers, and their work is to shepherd. shepherd There's the our church. word, yeah. pastor. That's it. Yeah. Their, their work is to pastor That's the flock. Right. Mm-hmm. You see it again in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, 5 and yep. verse 2. 
that the elders are to shepherd the flock. And there's, our, there's again, there's our work to, to pastor. Yep. And so ultimately, it's the elders' work to shepherd or to pastor. And the preacher then, the preaching that's mm-hmm. done in that congregation right. would come under their oversight. That's right, that's right. You can have an elder that that serves as the preacher. You're one. <laughs> but but uh, frequently, right. he, the, the preacher doesn't serve as an elder, and so he's under the oversight of the elders who listen to him preach and evaluate his preaching and make sure that it's according to Scripture. It's what the congregation needs. Amen. Now, we, we are not going to have time this go around to get into the specifics, but I did want to say a few things about the ideas of qualifications. First of all, if God has ordained qualifications for these men, two things flow from that. One, they must have all of these qualifications. They must satisfy all these qualifications in order to be appointed as an elder. And this may seem kind of silly, but all of these qualifications can be met. Right, so right. We, we certainly want to make sure that we interpret First Timothy three one through seven in a way that's consistent with the idea that over the ages man can satisfy these qualifications. Uh, God never put anything down that is impossible to satisfy. Right. Now, sometimes you'll get people that are so desperate to have elders that they start to water down the qualifications or ignore qualifications or kind of say, "Well, the gist of it is." We, we got to resist that temptation. As you said, a congregation can exist for a period of time without elders. That's not ideal. We want to have elders because that's what God wants for the church. Right. It operates best under that. But we also don't want to disregard these qualifications in the rush to put elders in place. That's right. That's right. And I know our time's out, but just think about in the New Testament where you find elders. You find elders in the mm-hmm. church at Jerusalem. You do, yeah. You find elders there. Uh, you find uh, Paul appointing elders mm-hmm. in these churches uh, in his in his journey. So you find elders being appointed there. You find elders in the church at Philippi. That's yep. altogether yep. a different place. That's right. Philippians That's right. chapter one and mm-hmm. verse one. That's right. And here in Tim- Timothy's in Ephesus. Yep. And so there are elders being appointed at different times in the New Testament. Uh-huh. In lots of different places. That's right. That sounds like a pattern to me, Kevin. Absolutely. I don't know what you think. That's, Absolutely. That sounds like a pattern to me. Yep. And so what our objective is, is to follow that pattern. That's right. And implement it in, in churches today. And so that's that's what we're trying to do. That's what we uh, want to get other other people, other churches to consider doing Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. So we challenge you, you know, look at your congregation and, and see, is it scripturally organized the way we've talked about here? Having elders and deacons, we haven't really got to that yet. Uh, but men that have jurisdiction over that congregation <clears throat> and who meet these qualifications. And we're going to talk about that more in some of the uh, podcasts to come. But it's just a very important thing that we do things God's way. Uh, one principle we see throughout the scriptures is uh, God is glorified when people do what he says. And, and sometimes people get that backwards and say, well, no, 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 God glorified but me freelancing and do this, that. No, no, no. Just do what God said. That's how you show the highest respect, the highest love, the highest reverence. You do what God says and only what he says, and then he's glorified. Any final comments before we uh, close out with a prayer? Well, we'll continue our, our study, study next week. We hope everybody can, can join us. Uh, and uh, read ahead. Read ahead. Yeah. Give, give it yeah. some thought. And then kind of bring your thoughts to, to the study. That's and good, and good that'll point. be, uh, yeah. I think that'll be uh, very beneficial. All right. Well, we're going to close out with a word of prayer. And I ask Brother Hutto to lead sure. that for us. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you. We acknowledge your greatness, your worthiness of our our devotion and loyalty. Uh, wor- uh, you're worthy of our our worship and honor and praise. And Father, we pray that uh, even though we are unworthy to come before you, uh, especially to come before you as your children, uh, that we that you'll hear us when we pray. We, we're so thankful, Father, that you invite us to come to you in prayer. Uh, that your ears are open to our supplication. And we pray, Father, that you'll continue to hear us as as we come to you from time to time in prayer. Uh, We praise you and we honor you, not only because of the things that you've done for us, all the many wonderful blessings that we enjoy, but we praise you simply because of who you are, that you are the almighty uh, God, the creator of the universe our creator, our sustainer, and ultimately our judge as well, Father. Father, we're thankful for the spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. We're thankful that he came to this world, that he shed his blood on the cross to make atonement for our sins, and that it's through him and through this wonderful gift of grace that we can have fellowship with you and that we can have the hope of eternal life. 
Help us, Father, to live according to your will, to live according to your word, to conform ourselves to what you would have us to be as you reveal that to us in Scripture. Father, we pray for this study, for our podcast, that we will accurately teach your word, that it will find good and honest hearts, and that the the seed of the word will uh, fall into those hearts and will ultimately bear fruit. Father, help us to understand what you have to say to us here in this book, 1 Timothy. Help us to see what we ought to do and the path that we ought to follow. We, we pray, Father, for this congregation, the Oak Mountain congregation, and the elders that work with it. We pray that you'll give us wisdom, uh, that we'll be able to see the things uh, that uh, need to be addressed and see the things that we need to do in order to make this church strong and useful in your service. But not only for this congregation, Father, do we pray, but for all of those churches uh, that uh, are striving to do your will, to follow your word and put it into practice. Uh, We know, Father, we understand, we trust that doing things your way is the best way. And so we want to learn your way and then put those things into practice. Father, we pray that you'll bless us in those efforts. Again, Father, we're thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, the wonderful blessings that we have through him. And it's in his name that we pray these things.